Okay, I think I'm good to go. Um, so, in which case, um, thank you all for attending. I think I've sorted it out. Great. So, thank, thanks. Um, oh, um, yes, okay. So, uh, yeah, so uh, the, this talk is about deep learning in Maple. Um, so, uh, essentially, the structure uh, I want to follow, the overview is firstly a, a, a quick introduction to what is meant by the term deep learning. Um, secondly, uh, what, is, what do we have in Maple that is related to this, this theme, in, in particular uh, an introduction to the deep learning package in Maple. Um, now I should, I should state up front that this is primarily a vehicle for providing access for, to Maple users for, to uh, deep learning tools, in, in this particular case Google TensorFlow. Um, we have yet to truly integrate this uh, deep learning framework into the other parts of Maple. So, the, so right now this is there primarily as in case you want to use it by itself directly um, in the course of some other Maple work um, within Maple. Uh, and the, the topic of integrating it in interesting ways with the other kinds of things that Maple does, uh, in particular comp symbolic computation and other things like that, is, is, an, is a topic for discussion which I'll mention here but is sort of future work. Um, and then we'll, at the end, we'll see some examples of uh, the deep learning package in action. So uh, before I get into deep learning, I should first talk about ma what m uh, machine learning. Um, I apologize for those of you for whom this is extremely basic uh, knowledge, um, but I'll, I'll kind of give a, a very quick run through for those of you who, for whom, whom this is a relatively new subject. Um, so what do we mean by uh, machine learning? <coughs> Well, in, in sort of the traditional model where, where a program was written by a guy in a basement with a stack of pizzas, um, the, uh, the, the, the data, the program is crafted, the data goes in, uh, it is processed by a computer and output is generated. Um, in this, the, the, the program is in fact generated from output, from, from, uh, from data that's really the, the data that's been acquired. Um, so so it, it, the computer is really learning itself. So we'll, we'll, that's a very kind of coarse idea. But um, there's a lot of different frameworks for machine learning that are, that are in, out there now, and uh, they all have uh, relative benefits and, and uh, weaknesses. Um, so uh, decision trees support vector machines, Bayesian networks, genetic algorithms artificial neural networks, um, and it's the last on which I'm going to spend all the time. Uh, so that is generally what is meant with the phrase deep learning, although that there's a lot of ambiguity in that phrase, and some people would probably argue differently. Uh, so, but, but what I'm going to use it to mean uh, in this context is, is multi-layer uh, neural networks. Um, so, all right, so that's, that's a, a, an introduction to to machine learning. Um, so neural networks. Um, so a, a neural network is, is an information processing paradigm inspired by the biological nervous system, in, in, in particular the human brain. Um, and the idea is you have uh, a series of, of nodes which are connected to other nodes arranged in layers where there is a uh, and these, these sort of, sort of correspond or were, were inspired by neurons within the human brain. Um, and each of the connections between these neurons, like the synapses in, in a brain, um, can transmit signals and, and they, they, they don't communicate all their information all the time. There's supposed to be sort of a, no, a notion of some threshold over which one must pass in order to, um, uh, in order to uh, reach the, the next... Uh, the next node, um, and in the, in the, as an implementation detail in the way these are, are crafted, um, there are weight functions attached to all of these edges between nodes, and it is the, in that assignment of weights and in the choice of the transfer functions from, from node to node, which really is the meat of the implementation of the neural network. Um, that's where all the magic happens, and, uh, and so w the idea, I guess, this was, this was initially invented very, very early in the, relatively early in the history of computer science, probably, uh, I think, in the 60s. Um, 
And uh, with, it's also, this is classically called the multilayer perceptron. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so the, the, this, was, this was something certainly I, uh, I learned about myself in, back in, in the beginnings of my computer science education. Um, but I think it wasn't until recent years where we had really the, the, the implementation and the hardware to, to realize some of the benefits we're now seeing. Um, so yeah, uh, in neural networks you have an input layer where, where you read in data from, the, from whatever the, the, coming in from wherever the, the, whatever data source you're using. Um, some number of hidden layers, possibly is, I think, I think in, it can be as, low, as few as zero, um, but possibly many more. Um, and so, so the, the layers can be, have both, there can, you can have a certain number of nodes at, you can vary the number of nodes at a layer and vary the number of layers and, and I suppose multiple layers can have multiple numbers of nodes, varying numbers of nodes, et cetera, um, and, and an output layer. Uh, so they're all pretty much arranged like that. Um, and the layers can, I, I suppose you can, uh, there are, as I mentioned, that, that the, the transfer functions between, um, between nodes uh, can vary depending on the implementation of the, of the neural network. Um, so these are these, these so-called activation functions. So the, the, if, it, if you were to view this as analogous to uh, like a digital circuit, um, then it obviously could have either be a live wire or not. So that would be sort of the equivalent of the heavy side step function, which is either on or off. But as for the purposes of computation, one of the things we want to do with these networks is essentially compute gradients uh, all the way backwards up the tree. And f in, in order to do that, we, we want something that's at least slightly continuous. Um, and that's why things like the logistic curve, and I think now other types of functions are, are used for, for activation functions. Um, so, and then another, another important function that comes up often in the case of uh, discussions about neural networks is this so-called softmax function. Um, this is just a sum of an exponential function divided by a sum of exponential functions. And the, ben the nice benefit that this has is um, it, you the argument can be basically any, any real numbers, including negative real numbers. Um, but the result is, uh, has this, the property that the sum of all of the components um, that is e of z i for i from 1 to k, and the sum of all of those will sum to 1. So this, this comes in handy when you're doing, say, a classification task where you wish to uh, assign, which you, you wish to choose one of, um, to assign a, a, a tentative category of out of, say, k items uh, to some, some, some data and you want to, ass to ass assign a probability distribution for the, it's, it's a, um, for which of the, for each K of that, of those K items or wh which, uh, which category it most likely belongs in. Um, so these are just a, a few functions that, that come up often in the case of deep learning. Um, so what is, what is deep learning? Uh, deep learning is learning with the deep neural network. I, I think some would argue that it's not sufficient to just have a multi-layer perceptron to call it deep learning. Some would probably say that you need um, more stuff, more of the sort of rich features that we see now. Uh, so that these are so-called, the, there's special types of, uh, of neural networks for particular applications that, that are often discussed, um, in particular in recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural networks. Um, and those are, as I understand anyway, layers, simply layers with, uh, ver uh, with a particular s purpose and design, but ultimately it is still a neural network. Um, and so, so in, in, the, in a sort of uh, the, the generous or loose sense, a, d a deep neural network is simply an artificial neural network with, with multiple hidden layers between the input and output layers. Um, so, and, uh, and yeah, so, so in, in practice, um, Deep learning t usually refers to de deep neural networks with, with many, many inputs and outputs, the sort of thing that you need you know, real s iron to, to process or, or, or distribute over lots of different 
um, machines. Um, so yeah, and, and then uh, now we have really big data sets on which we can, which we can throw at these, these things. So the, the uh, probably I, I, I suspect the reason for the recent rise in popularity of these kinds of tools is not just the ubiquity of, uh, of strong uh, hardware and, and, um, and good algorithms, but also the availability of, of really big data sets that we can throw at, the, throw at these things. Um, so yeah, the, a, a little bit of insight into what is going on and with this, the, all these different layers. So um, uh, this isn't how they always work, but this is, this is an example of how it might work. Um, you could have, uh, this is I think especially true of convolutional neural networks, um, you, you might have the first layer um, learning like the first order features about the data, um, for, exa for example, uh, edges of an image, uh, the second layer learning slightly higher order features, combinations of first layer features and combinations of edges. Um, and then, uh, then you have different, uh, yeah, so, so you can do, do so-called unsupervised or supervised learning um, and, and discover in, in an unsupervised case general features of the input space. Um, and then there's, there's lots of things you can do with it. And as I mentioned, there's two types of neural networks that seem to come up a lot in, in practice for, for applications. Um, recurrent neural networks where connections between nodes uh, form a directed graph along a temporal sequence. If, if you like, the, the neural network can sort of feed back into itself in a sense and there is a notion of, of time. So uh, you, you can have, um, and th this, is, this is what we, uh, we often see uh, in language modeling. So all of the, anytime you've ever seen a neural network that you know, is generating poetry or, uh, or song lyrics or, or any of that sort of things or, or, or songs for that matter, they're typically, I think, using uh, RNNs. And convolutional neural networks are, are uh, regularly used in stuff like computer vision and image processing. So the, this would be um, like these, these uh, online, well, and a good example probably would be the thing we saw last night with the, uh, uh, with the Maple Companion app with uh, handwriting recognition. So that would be, I don't know if that actually uses a convolutional neural network, but if you were, if you were trying to use a neural network for this purpose, that would be what you would want to use. That would be, you would probably have a test data, test data of uh, quite a lot of examples of, of human handwriting and possibly print handwriting and then, and then generate something that could, was ho hopefully good in a general purpose way. Um, right, so, so there's, a, there's a lot of deep learning platforms, um, mostly spearheaded by various high profile tech companies, which have uh, come out in recent years. Uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you have, even if you had, don't know much about deep learning, have, might have encountered some of these names. So um, Apache Spark, Theano, which is I believe from Facebook, no, Facebook Torch is from Facebook, Theano, one of them is yeah, I don't remember who, who was behind that one. Um, Google TensorFlow is obviously from Google. And, and yeah, so there's, there's like a, a wide variety of these, these different tools. Um, and most of them are free or, or some variant of them is free. Um, so and they're being <coughs> used by hobbyists and professionals of all, all, all varieties. Um, and so a, a little bit about Google TensorFlow. Uh, it's available at tensorflow.org. Um, it uh, is, was released uh, under an Apache license, Apache 2.0, in 2015, I think the, for the first version. Uh, it was developed by Google to, for, to build and train neural networks for their, I think, internal purposes, probably uh, their, their own data analysis. Um, it, it's, it's a bit, uh, it's obviously, been contributed to from a lot of people, all doing a lot of different things. It has a, 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 it has a slightly, especially when I was, I was looking at the first version of the API, it has a very chaotic sort of feel because there's a lot of libraries that do something slightly similar to what other libraries do and I think they've consolidated that quite a bit in the version uh, two of their, of their uh, product and their API. 
uh, which was released two weeks ago, uh, although it was obviously under some kind of uh, beta process for some months prior. Um, there are considerable differences in the API from 1.x. So if we want to adopt, we already, so as I'm going to mention, we, we have essentially a, a redistributed version of TensorFlow in, in Maple now. And if we want to uh, upgrade to, two, to version 2 of the API, where there will be some implications to that for us. Um, anyway, so going on, um, yeah, so the deep learning package in Maple. Um, so we, in 20, Maple 2018, we introduced the deep learning package. Um, it provides an interface to Google TensorFlow uh, via Google TensorFlow's Python API. Uh, although you don't know that, you don't have to know that you're using Python. It's, uh, it's, from your point of view, it just looks like a Maple package. Um, and TensorFlow version 1.10 is included in the Maple 2019 distribution. Um, for Mac OS, Linux, and 64-bit Windows, um, TensorFlow isn't available for 32-bit Windows, so that's just something we can't do because um, they don't support it. Um, and yeah, so the, the, the principal, the goal is, is to provide access to deep learning methods for Maple users. Uh, so the, and the goal, our, our vision was simply that we would um, sort of, after introducing it, uh, simultaneously expose more parts of the TensorFlow API within Maple um, with the proviso that we, we don't want to ha probably have the full complexity and, and confusion of the, in, the entire TensorFlow API visible in Maple. But also, we, would, we want to find ways to adopt, to, to apply this stuff to, in interesting ways to other parts of Maple and maybe to ma the data of Maple users. Um, so yeah, so we support a subset of the TensorFlow version 1 Python IP API. And for 2020, um, we have to, the, the one thing I want to get in for sure is support for recurrent neural networks. Um, we, will, we are considering uh, upgrading to version 2 of the API. I think that's, that should be possible. And, and then that one hopes anyway that once they've broken compatibility uh, in the way they've done and uh, gone with version 2 that things will be rather more stable for, for some time going forward. Fingers crossed. Um, so that's, uh, that's the deep learning package in Maple. Um, this is just a, you'll see it in, in action, but this is just a, a quick screenshot of it. For those of you who have ever seen the Python API for TensorFlow, this, this will look somewhat familiar. It also looks so, somewhat familiar to Maple. So this is, um, this, is just a, this is just a Maple array, but it's an array of, of variables in a deep learning session, which is really a TensorFlow session. Um, and they, uh, they all have like a type, which is analogous to Maple types that we, you would use on a Maple matrix or something. So this is like a data type, this, which essentially means a 32-bit float, um, et cetera. So these are, and then you can do, you can build these, these placeholders. Uh, they have this, uh, this design, which they, added for the first version of the API, which is you, it's a little bit um, indirect. It, it doesn't seem that unnatural to me, maybe because uh, it has a somewhat symbolic feel. And so coming from a symbolic you know, computation background, at least sort of, um, it, it seems sort of natural. But the idea is that you, in TensorFlow, you, you would build a, a graph of a computation before you ever run anything. So you would, uh, you, would dis you would say that you want this variable to be the sum of these other two variables. And this other variable is going to be the, the product of these, these collection of variables. But you would do all that before you ever actually had any concrete data at the leaves. And then and, and effectively, behind the scenes, you're building this, this uh, directed graph. Um, and then finally, when you're ready, you, you throw some some data added and you, you generate stuff. Uh, people found that very weird, I think, because they, they it, it's, it would be, it's, it's really analogous in Maple to starting out with an undefined symbol and then doing arithmetic with that symbol and then, uh, and then ending up with like some, uh, some symbolic expression of that original symbol 
which, which has, where, in which the symbol remains unevaluated. Um, people who are coming from a sort of traditional programming environment where, where every variable must always have a value continue to find that unusual about a computer algebra system. And then this is really analogous to that. So for version two of their API, they, they decide to drop that. And uh, I think they still have a graph, but they just always insist that every variable also has a value. Anyway, um, going on. So uh, yeah, um, th so, so we've, we've implemented this, uh, this package in Maple, which is really a, uh, a bridge to the, these, this deep learning tool. Um, it fits within a family of other packages where we've, we've extended Maple via access to other third-party tools. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff out there and uh, we, we try to take what, what makes sense and, and put it into Maple. Um, some of which, some of these, these connections we've, we've heard about today in other, either this or other sessions. Uh, so we have, um, obviously we, for, for mathematics, we have access to such things as the GNU multi-precision library and uh, Naughty for automorphism groups, uh, LA Pack, and, and for applications like SAT solving, we, we draw on external SAT solvers um, and various other things. So, so this is the idea of, of building a bridge to a, to a third party tool like this has ample precedent in Maple. And, and it, it's uh, kind of part of the philosophy of incorporating uh, computations with a different design paradigm than traditional computer algebra in, uh, in making them available to Maple users. So, um, so the, the, the fact that I mentioned SAT, uh, I guess I've, I've had the benefit of, of um, being, uh, having my, being exposed simultaneously to both, uh, both the SAT SMT stuff and, uh, uh, and, and the, the deep learning and so this, um, for th those of you who don't know uh, what I mean by SAT SMT, I apologize. Uh, they, they were, that was discussed elsewhere in, in the other session, and I think perhaps otherwise today. But, but essentially, this is a, uh, a, um, a third-party library for solving in, uh, Boolean satisfiability instances. Um, but but the, the, there's kind of an instructive example uh, here for, by comparison with including uh, a deep learning tool. So um, with both SAT and machine learning, you, you're dispatching this queries from a computer algebra system to a tool with a, a, pretty, a very different design methodology and you have to kind of accept a certain element of uncertainty in what you get. Um, so the, the SAT SMT solvers, um, it's not, if they give you an answer, you can usually trust it. It's just that they might not give you an answer. Um, I guess that's often true, sometimes true of Maple too. Uh, but, um, the, uh, but, but because, it's NP, because they are always trying to solve NP-complete problems, you, you can never guarantee you'll get one. Um, and and a, a neural network classifier can never promise 100% correctness because you're only as good as the data you use to train the model. Um, so, okay. So that's all about the deep learning package in Maple. Um, we will see it live shortly. Um, maybe this would be a good time to to show you that actually. I think I'll just break from here and open um, open Maple. Um, and okay, so what I'm first going to show you is a simple example. This was uh, this is the so-called Iris data set. Um, the so I guess this this originates from an old paper from uh, the 30s or something, uh, where somebody gathered up a whole bunch of, uh, measured a whole bunch of quantities of different iris flowers. Um, so petal length and uh, sepal length, petal width, et cetera. So this is like a classic problem with, uh, in data analysis. Um, viewing at this, analyzing it, uh, maybe performing a PCA on it and trying to, so th there are three species, um, I think, what are they? Yeah, Cet Iris setosa, Iris versicolor, and I Iris virginica. So two, three different species. And the, the, the goal really is to attempt to see if you can uh, identify without knowing up front what species each sample corresponds to, um, which if, if, if essentially if you can recapture this, this last column. 
based just by analyzing the numerical quantities in these four columns. Um, so if you visualize that, the, uh, there's no machine learning going on here. This is just purely uh, visualization in Maple. So this is this is a data set actually that's already curated in Maple, and so this is this page is is right from the Maple's help system. Um, this, so this is just the first few lines of, of the samples, sample data. Um, and you can see various statistical quantities here about this data set um, and other things. The thing I wanted to show you is just here, this gives you a little bit of a sense of what the data looks like. Um, so this is, these, this is a visualization, I, I think, of of each of these physical quantities plotted against one another, uh, sepal, wink, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. And so these are, the color corresponds to the three species. And you can see that the green and the blue, I don't remember which species those correspond to, are f sort of commingled. But the, the red is quite clearly separated. So, and of course, it's, it's, it would probably be quite easy or one imagines so anyway, to, to write something which, se which separated the red from the green and blue, but separating the green and blue from each other um, it, and doing so accurately is a classically challenge, challenging problem. Um, so, so our goal is to attempt to do that with a neural network classifier. What are the ones below? What are the dials um, There's correlations or something? Correlations. Yes. yes, correlation between the two, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so that, that, this is just a bunch of quantities, and, that, and this is, so this is, down here you see a PCA plot. I apologize that it's not very, it's not bigger. It's, oh yeah, okay, I can't, I can try and make that slightly. Um, so yeah, you can see here again, the red, or brown, or whatever that is, is very clearly separated, and, and these, even in the PCA, is, I mean, you could, you could probably draw some kind of curvy line that would mostly separate them. It, it should be, it, it looks at least possible, but doing so um, and with 100% accuracy is probably a challenge. So, uh, yeah, um, so, so the, getting over to our, our task of classifi classification, um, so we're going to start here and pull in some data from, so here I've separated uh, the original IRIS data set into uh, test data and training data. Um, this is the, so the idea being that you should always um, clearly distinguish in, the, in, in all machine learning your, your, the data which, with, with, with which you train the, the model and the data with which you test your trained model, um, otherwise you risk merely reproducing, I mean, you, you, can, you can always guarantee 100% accuracy on, on the training data, um, but you can't ever promise that. So, you, so the idea is the test data should remain pristine until the model has been trained up to the point where you want to use it. So we run that. Um, so we have 30 rows of test data and 120 rows of training data that represent these three species. Um, and I'll just step through these steps. So we're loading deep learning. Uh, we're building the so-called numeric columns, um, each of which corresponds to uh, one of the quantities involved. So this is, this is already making use of, of TensorFlow. Um, and we, we build a classifier. And now we train it uh, with 2,000 steps. And, and now, finally, we are going to evaluate the results so with this short number of steps, this is a pretty small data set, right, 100, 150 carriers. But with this training on, on uh, the original data, we can do 96.66% accuracy in identifying the, 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 the data. That is, on our, what that means is that on our test data, um, the, the model we train from a training data is, gets, gets the, the species classification right. 96.6% of the time. It would be interesting to know, I didn't look at this now, how, many of the, how much of the test data was that red points that were way off, clearly, clearly separated, and how much of it was the, the two that were hard to separate. Because 
I think they were just randomly, randomly selected. Um, and yeah, uh, so here you can, um, you can use the train model. So here, we'll, we'll, let's just the, um, pick a new point within the sample space. Um, so just with, it has quantities vaguely like the ones that we, that occurred in the, da the data set. And we can throw it back in the model. Oh, um, sorry, I forgot to execute that line. And finally, yeah, so here what we get is the logits and a set of probabilities. So this prediction from the, the trained neural network model um, reports that with 91.5% confidence, or 91.6% confidence, that this, um, this particular sample will correspond to the th whatever the third one of, the <laughs> of this thing. I think that was the Versicolor, because I think I made it uh, alphabetic. Um, so because I only have five minutes left, I'm going to jump to a, another kind of fun example, also using deep learning, um, which is host a seasonally themed example. OK, so we start with a, pic a, cute, a fun picture. OK, so um, it's, uh, you know what I'm going for here, I think. Um, so, so we have a, a picture here. And the, now I imagine we are shooting a bullet or pointing at this, a random point on this, on this, uh, on this picture. Uh, what we want to do is come up with some function which tells us, true or false, whether or not we've hit uh, a point which is actually on the pump jack-o'-lantern, um, meaning on the actual jack-o'-lantern not including an eye or not including the mouth. So that's encapsulated in this procedure here, which returns one if you've if it's orange and two if it's not. So we want to generate some training data. Um, so this is 10,000 data points that we've thrown at this model, which are either orange or not, <laughs> um, either on, on the, the pumpkin or not. And we want to, so, so let's visualize them and see what they look like. So the blue, the orange ones are orange, the blue ones are blue. Um, so it looks like a pumpkin which it should, because we haven't done any machine learning yet. Now we want to generate some test data. We'll do, we'll do 2,000 points of that. And here we load deep learning. Um, we build a numeric classifier, uh, which is it's a numeric column, rather, x for, for x and y. Um, we build a, a classifier. And here is the, where the magic happens. So here we, this is a, a procedure I've written Maybe I'll make that slightly smaller so it doesn't wrap quite so much. It still wraps, anyway. Um, uh, that can go away. OK, so this, this, what this does is throws a bunch of training, throws uh, a, a, some training data, 300 steps of training data at the model, and then throws the test data at the model and, see, and, and checks just what the model looks like now. So we want to execute this a bunch of times and see hopefully, the, the, the pumpkin evolve in, as it goes. Um, I think I m failed to execute something along the way, because that went way too fast. Uh, OK. Um, OK, that's going, that's going slightly slower, which is what I wanted. Um, OK. so. So basically, the, what are we, what's going on here in this line? Um, the, as I said, we're training. We're, we're providing the training data. Um, the, this is accessing the first two columns of training data and passing that in as the, as the input. This is passing is orange in as the expected output. And we're saying we want to do this for 300 steps. Um, we want to shuffle the data, which means it, it, it do, basically randomly selects a bunch of rows from the original 10,000 points that we gave. Um, and then classifier predict will pass in the test data. Uh, also, it not shuffle because it doesn't need to shuffle the, the, the pardon me? You'll see it at the end. It, it does, well, it, it's all, I think it's actually, maybe it's finished now. Oh no, it's still going on six. Um, yeah, so it's doing 300, 300 steps on each one. It's currently on seven. And this, and uh, riffing off uh, Daniel's 
um, examples with interactive components we saw at the end. Um, this is a slider and a plot view. So we can see the, uh, the evolution of the pumpkin as, uh, as it gets more and more accurate. Um, so, yeah, we're on nine. And, and then, yeah, just to explain this last bit, this is, um, this is just pulling out the points and, and it's, it's grabbing the ones that are only above zero. So it's, it's only drawing the orange points. Um, okay, so if we, th that is, yeah, so here we see, it doesn't look like much. Those are the first 300 points. Those are the first, well, it's the first, the it's, it's all the test data. It's the, it's the test data applied to the state of the neural network classifier at, after only 300 st steps of training. Uh, and then this is, so it, it's always the same points, but they're going to get, be classified differently because the, net, the neural network is evolving as it trains more. And so, so it l starts to look a little different. It starts to look a little different. And you can see all the way by the end, you can kind of, maybe I need a few more points to throw at it. Um, but you, you can see that, that uh, the, 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 the basic story is there that it looks kind of like the original pumpkin. And you can certainly see at least the eyes and the mouth. So, happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and finally, uh, on that, so, so yeah, um, uh, I, th I know I'm a little over time now, uh, just at the end of time, but just a, maybe a few comments about how we might use machine learning. Um, there's the, the main goal here is heuristics, where we would, we would want to decide between algorithms where, which are, one of the is equivalent in practice, but may vary considerably in performance, uh, al along the lines of what Dorian was speaking about in the, uh, his, in the other session, um, that's a, a perfect example of variable ordering. Um, and this is a case study about chromatic numbers where we, we, we have a, a case like that where we're essentially running two equivalent algorithms. There are a few obvious examples within Maple of routines where we have to choose between one of a bunch of methods, all of which in principle generate uh, equivalent output but, but can vary probably considerably in, in performance. Um, so linear algebra determinant, linear solve, optimization minimized. These are um, six different methods of, of uh, numeric integration that are offered within EvalF int. Um, and yeah, we already saw the, the examples. So here are the questions. Um, how, can we, how can we use neural network techniques uh, usefully in computer algebra, despite the fact that we expect the latter to be exact and and behave deterministically, effectively. Um, and where do we get all the data that we would want to train machine models for computer algebra? We, were, we need like maybe benchmark libraries and that sort of thing. Um, and so future work, um, expose more of the deep learning, of the TensorFlow API and deep learning. Um, and then think about uh, possibly replacing human coded heuristics within the Maple library by heuristics which have been tailored to uh, data. Um, so there are probably some rather arbitrary heuristics which, which have historically worked well in practice but which have never really been uh, thoroughly examined. Um, and maybe, maybe there's something, there is a heuristic which we could find via uh, machine learning methods which would uh, yield something better. So um, yeah. Uh, thanks for everything. Uh, sorry, I don't have a lot of time for questions. <laughs> <laughs>